Hello everyone. Welcome to episode three of the Visible Monday Workshop presented by the Davenport Public Library. Today we're going to be talking about Boro and getting our first taste of Sashiko stitching. As you can say, see here, Boro is basically layering patches and then securing the fabric with simple Sashiko stitches. Here's another example that I was experimenting with. Before we get started, I wanted to show you a couple of books that would be of interest. The first one we've talked about before, this is Visible Mending by Arona Konaraj. There isn't a lot of boro in this book, but she does have a lovely project where she layers a variety of patches to create a cushion. Notice that she's using lighter colored fabric. Traditionally, boro is done on dark fabric, but this modern interpretation works just as well. The second book I wanted to talk about is The Book of Boro by Susan Briscoe. Not only does this book describe boro techniques in depth, but there are a variety of projects presented that you can use your boro stitching with. And in addition, there's an extensive uh, chapter on the history of boro, including many photos of vintage and antique clothing. Let's talk about the materials that we'll need for today's episode. You'll need some basics like thread snips. You may need some fabric shears if you need to cut down your fabric patches to more manageable sizes. You're going to need needles. Now these up here are embroidery needles. Uh, today we're gonna to be using sashiko needles, which are definitely longer. If you got our kit, which was a limited supply, um, they will, there will be an embroidery needle and a sashiko needle in there. So today you're gonna to start using this real long needle. You're going to need some thread. Now this is sashiko thread. Uh, if you got your kit, the kit that we had uh, available, uh, you'll have a skein like this in the kit. If you don't have sashiko thread and didn't get the kit, don't panic. You can definitely use pearl cotton. Uh, which is very easy to find in the craft stores. This is number eight. Uh, this indicates the size of the, the thread. Uh, number eight or number five work just fine. You will of course need some patches, uh, just scraps of fabric that you have laying around that you may have uh, gathered up, left over from other projects. Uh, there are a few small pieces in the kit. If you got that, you can use those if you want or not, it doesn't matter. And then you're going to need your foundation fabric. Now, I this is uh, some patching I already put together from some uh, patches that I had on hand, and I'm layering them on this uh, blue piece of uh, larger material. This is what I'm going to use for my sampler, as I keep calling them, uh, and which I'll make the drawstring bag from at the in the final episode. Now, if you don't want to make the bag, that's totally optional, but you will need some foundation fabric in which to practice the burrow patching on. So you're gonna need some, some fabric for that. Let's talk about preparing the sashiko thread so that it doesn't get tangled when you're using it. Uh, if you got that kit, uh, you'll have a hank of sashiko thread like this in there. Uh, some sashiko thread comes on cards or in cones and it doesn't require this little extra step, but a lot of it comes like this and hangs. And uh, here's a really cool way to fix it up so that it doesn't get tangled and it's easy to access. So you take off the band that's on it and then it's probably been folded at least a couple times. So you need to kind of unfold it. Look for, uh, there should be a knot where the thread, because this is all one continuous piece of thread, uh, there should be a knot like this somewhere along the way, and that's where the, the ends of the thread were tied together. So you want to uh, straighten out your thread, make sure it's a one continuous loop like this. I'm going to set it like this 
here. And then if you have a piece of tape, I happen to have a roll of uh, washi tape here, so I'm just gonna put it here. If you have a piece of tape, tape the, the loop, one of the loop, one of the ends up here, and then straighten out your thread like this. And I have to uh, get a little closer here so it shows up on the screen. And then you're going to cut that knot off And cut that knot off. Threads. You're gonna cut through all of those threads like that. Okay. Now here comes the fun part. You're going to start up here toward the top. You can leave a loop. It doesn't have to be. You don't want it to be super tight at the top. And you separate separate them out into three three pieces like this of roughly equal amount at the end that you've taped down. Or if you have a help, helper nearby that will hold still for a few minutes, he can just hold the, the thread there with a the finger. It doesn't have to be a piece of tape. just makes it a little easier if you're on your own. You can't coerce anyone into helping you. And then you're going to uh, braid just a, a normal braid with those three hanks or those three uh, sections doesn't have to be a tight braid. Just keep going the whole length. Keep your tension fairly even. It doesn't need to be super tight. In fact, you don't want it to be super tight. Just, just enough to hold together gently. So you want to braid it to about the end, you don't have to go all the way to the very end, and you don't need to secure it or anything. You just uh, just stop when you're close to the end. Okay, so I'm gonna take it off the tape. Here. There you have a braided hank of sashiko thread. Now, to you use single thread when you're sashiko stitching, and to pull one out, you just grab one from the top loop here, just grab a single thread like this, and then just pull. You might have to pull one side at a time. And there it is. Your thread, hang, your braided hank has stayed together, and you've got a single thread to work with without any tangles. Also, it kind of keeps it organized and from getting messy in whatever box or holder that you're keeping your um, Sashiko supplies in. Okay, let's talk about the patches and arranging them here for a minute. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. You can do whatever you want and however looks good to you. If you're making the drawstring bag and you want to avoid uh, putting them too close to the edges so that they don't disappear into the seam allowance, which would probably be about half an inch, roughly, um, traditionally, they've used dark fabrics, but like I've shown you, that's not a hard and fast rule. You can use whatever you want, however you think looks best. Um, don't layer too many on top of each other. For practicing like this, it gets harder and harder to stitch through multiple heavy layers. And for the same reason, you might want to avoid denim for this practice. Um, denim, of course, is an ideal patch material because it's sturdy and it's very strong and will hold up well, but it tends to be a little thicker than regular cottons like this. So for practice, you might wanna avoid denim. Um, you can arrange them however you want, however you think looks good. You can layer them on top of each other, experiment with them a little bit, try out a few different ways of putting them together. You can stick to one color, or you can introduce another color or two. Completely up to you, however you think it looks good. So once you've decided on how you want your patches to go, you're going to need to um, secure them to the fabric before you start stitching or they'll go flying everywhere. So um, you can use some pins. I've also seen it recommended that you use something like uh, washable glue, like Elmer's, uh, that will wash out of fabric. 
pins can kind of uh, get caught up in your thread and kind of get in the way, but uh, they also work. And then we'll be ready for stitching. Okay, I'm going to show you how to knot the thread now. Uh, this is often called a tailor's uh, knot or a quilter's knot, so it's pretty common. So the needle's already threaded. I'm going to take the end here, the longer end, and I'm going to place it on top of the needle and under my thumb. So like this. Now I'm, I'm leaving this a little long so uh, for this demonstration so you can see pretty a little better what I'm doing. So the layers are I've got my finger, the needle, the thread, and my thumb on top of the thread. So then you wrap this uh, long thread around the needle a couple times, two or three times, uh, depending on how big of a knot you want. And then you make sure those loops are secure under your thumb. And I usually pull on this just a little bit to make sure it gets securely under my thumb. And then you grab the needle and you just pull. And you're left with a nice knot. Now this is a little long, like I said, I left it a little bit long. So I'm just gonna clip that off. And now we're ready to get started. So here are my patches that I've uh, secured to my uh, foundation piece. And I've got my knotted thread ready to get started here. So this is going to be the simplest of sashiko stitches. This is the running stitch. And you want to start a little bit outside of the patch. So this one, I'm going to even a couple stitches outside of your patch. And you can, uh, generally, it's just straight lines. Uh, sometimes you'll, and I'm going to do a little bit too that's going to go this way, so I'll have a little bit, that, some that are cross stitches. Um, sometimes you'll see this patch is done with uh, regular um, Sashiko patterns, um, but generally it's a straight stitch, just a straight running stitch. So I'm going to... A little hard to do so that the camera can see what I'm doing and I can see what I'm doing but you just make a series of small stitches what you want to think about are some nice even stitches okay, okay so we're ready to get started uh, we have our needle threaded and knotted, and we have our patches arranged and pinned in place. And what we're going to do now is uh, the first bit of sashiko stitching, the most, the simplest and most basic, which is just this plain straight running stitch. So I'm going to bring the thread up from behind. And you want to start outside of the patch because you're securing the patch to the fabric. So you don't want to start up here. You want to start back here and your foundation um, fabric. So I'm gonna roll this over so I can hold on to it. So pull up your thread. So I'm gonna start now stitching on the patch. I'm trying to keep my stitches even. And as you can see, I'm piling or threading several stitches on the needle. That's one reason why sashiko needles are so long. So you can put a whole bunch of stitches on it at once. Again, for practice, you don't need to do very many stitches at once. You can do one or two. Um, the trick is uh, getting them straight and even. And the only way that you get better at that is practice. Uh, slow down and practice. So you just keep going. You're uh, keeping your stitches as even as possible. It takes practice, some uh, concentration. I've seen videos of experts who can do this very fast. But that comes with experience and practice. So don't worry about going fast. Don't worry about loading up a certain number, number of stitches on your needle before you pull the thread through. Do what you're comfortable with. I 
find when I start out on this, my stitches are kind of less than perfect. And by the time I finish up a little project, they're looking better. So you can see my, this one's a little too small, but that's what homemade is about, right? Those uh, little imperfections. And I'm gonna go a couple stitches onto the foundation fabric here. because you want to secure the patch down. You don't want to just decorate the patch. And then I'm just going to travel over here and bring it up here for my next row back down. Now, you can see this one, this stitch is kind of crooked. You know, if it, and this one's kind of small. If that bothers you, um, go ahead and pull the thread out and try again. Um, this is after all practice. And uh, like I said, the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. So I'm, I am going to throw those out. This one's a little too large, too. I'll just pull them out here. Sashiko thread is easy to work with. So this goes pretty easily. Don't get too tied up in perfectionism. I mean, it doesn't need to be perfect. It's based on practicality. And um, because they, the originators of these techniques did a lot of this out of necessity, they got real good at it. Um, and they added their own creativity and craftsmanship to it. but that comes from practice and experience. So don't be too hard on yourself. A little bit of imperfection is just fine. So I will try again here. So I'm gonna work on this some more and then come back and show you my progress. I'm going to do lines that run this way um, throughout the whole patch section. And then um, I'm gonna do a couple of these patches. I'm gonna do some stitches going horizontally as well. So I will be back with progress. Okay, you can see I've gotten a good start on my vertical um, stitches. You can tell that they're not always evenly spaced apart. I might go in and put another line in here. Um, and my stitches aren't always perfectly straight and perfectly even, but I think it's working. I want to show you a couple uh, unique things about Sashiko. Uh, unlike regular embroidery where you go up and down, single, usually a single stitch at a time, in Sashiko you load up the needle with multiple stitches. And you're more pushing the fabric onto the needle rather than the needle doing the work. It's more like the fabric is doing the work. So you load up your needle and to uh, keep your tension uh, even, um, I often just lay it down. My tail's a little long there. And spread it out. Those are a little crooked, but, but they're working. Uh, the other thing about Sashiko is there's a whole range of thimbles that uh, people use when they're stitching sashiko. And I'm not used to using a thimble, I don't have any. Definitely can see their worth though. Um, there's one that's very common that sits like a ring inside your fing and uh, on your finger, and then there's a disc here, a small metal disc. You wear it either on this finger or this finger. And then you load up your needle with stitches and then you push it through with that thimble instead of with your fingers. And I can see how that would be very useful. There's also various needles, uh, some or various thimbles rather, for other fingers such as uh, leather thimbles. Um, some of the leather ones have a small metal disc on them and you would use that uh, part of the thimble to push the needle through after you've loaded it up.
Let's see, I'm going through more than one layer of cloth. And it is, after I warned you against doing that, it is harder to push them through. If I had a thimble here, that would really help, or a thimble here. So I can see why people like their thimbles and how they'd be very useful. If you are stitching through more than one layer of cloth or through thick, heavy cloth, hopefully for not too many stitches, like I just had a few stitches here of that, um, just slow down. I'll only put two or three stitches on your needle and pull them through. Uh, it'd be a lot easier that way. I'll be back with more progress in a bit. Okay, here's my finished borrow patch. As you can see, my stitching is far from perfect. There's some spacing issues and some of my stitches are kind of wonky, but I think it'll be fine. I also added some horizontal stitching here, uh, which adds some texture and a little bit of pattern. In traditional borrow, it's likely that patches were added a couple at a time and more were added as needed. So the different patches would have had a variety of stitching patterns. I could add some more lines of stitching. Uh, denser uh, stitching would create a firmer, more durable mend, but I think this works for the project that we're working on. I hope you enjoyed this episode and were inspired to try some borrow yourself. Uh, we would love to see what you create. If you post a picture on Instagram, Please use the hashtag DPL Visible Mending. DPL stands for Davenport Public Library. And tag the library at their Instagram account, which is at Davenport Library. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can contact me at ahetzler at davenportlibrary.com. Be sure to join us next week when we continue to explore Sashiko stitching by creating some of the patterns that Sashiko is known for, such as these. We'll create a couple little patches like this that we can then add to our sampler piece. Until next week, happy stitching. Mm -hmm.